Good evening. Welcome to The Connection. How's everybody doing this evening? Nice to see everybody out. Uh, is, have we got any announcements going on? Coffee, tea, and thee tomorrow. Normal time. Three o'clock. We've got, uh, we're gonna do, we're gonna do karaoke, uh, uh, Night to Shine karaoke next week. Hi, Linda. Hi. We're gonna turn the service over to Mark and Kira next week and we're gonna do, uh, gonna do a karaoke with them. And, uh, and so we're gonna have a nice time with that. We've got a, we've got a funeral coming up on, on the on the weekend so we're not going to be here so it would be a nice time to nice time to show some appreciation to our night to shine folks and let them have a have a How little evening worth of singing so so that's what we're going to do there uh we've got got uh oh we ain't got no conference is coming up in june that's all my registrations and so forth and so on going on around that we've got that going on what else we got going on mark you got anything I'm sure I do, but I just can't remember it right now. Okay, well, that's good. That's uh, good. Wednesday night, we will not be having the regular meal uh, due to spring break, but we will have the ministries building open for the parenting classes if anybody's interested. Okay. So. Parenting classes, if anyone's interested, we've still we've still got, as you notice, we've still got some screens down. Uh, got somebody to come and look at that Monday or Tuesday. Uh, try to get that up and running and and uh, everything. We we uh, we have uh, we have been doing we have been working with this. Uh, our technicians here at the church have been working with this and trying to get this straightened out for quite some time. And I, they have exhausted every avenue that they and and so and so. I want to thank Mark. Jody, everybody that's been participating in that because they've they've worked at it for quite some time, and so we're going to turn it over to somebody else and let them see if they can fix it. <laughs> so, so we got that going on. Is anything else? Nothing else. If nothing else, let's stand and worship. That's my favorite part of the service, anyway. Oh, I haven't got I haven't got a clicker. I probably should have one of those. Thank you, Mark. you turned into wine open the eyes of the blind there's no one like you none like you into the darkness you shine out of the ashes we rise there's no one like you None like you. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer. Awesome in power. Our God. Our God. Into the darkness you shine. Out of the ashes we rise, there's no one like you, none like you. Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? What could stand against? Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer. Awesome in power, our God, our God. And 
And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? What could stand against? What could stand against? You may be seated. Would you pray with me, please? Good and gracious Heavenly Father, mighty God, we come before you once today. Lord, we just thank you. We thank you for an opportunity to be in your house with your people. We ask, dear Father, that you would be with us in this service, dear Lord, and stir that Holy Spirit that you put inside of each and every one of us, dear Lord, that we might receive your words. We ask, dear Father, that you would bless this congregation and bless our small group. We, we love you so much, and we ask for your blessings and your continuous everything to your name be glorified in Jesus precious and holy name we pray amen I come humbly to your throne. You are my Lord, you are my Lord. And you always have the answer, always have the answer to my call. my hope, you are my hope, you hear my cry, show your mercy to this world, you are my hope, you are my hope, and you always have the answer, always have the answer, for the world, the answer is Jesus Christ. To every question, every doubt, you shed your light. You are the key to love divine. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the answer. You are my joy, you are my joy. You comfort me in every anxious moment, Lord. You are my joy, you are my joy, and you always have the answer, always have the answer to it all. Every doubt you shed your light, you are the key to love divine. Jesus is the answer, Jesus is the answer. In days of darkness, fear and trouble, you there in all life's trials showing grace in my despair an everlasting love enough to change the world to every question Jesus the answer 
every question, Jesus is the answer. Every question that we have in our lives, in our minds, it's all there. The answer is always there. We have to be willing to listen to the answer. Every time I try to make it on my own Every time I try to stand and start to fall And all those lonely roads that I have traveled on There was Jesus When the life I built came crashing to the ground and the friends I had were nowhere to be found. I couldn't see it then, but I can see it now. There was Jesus. In the waiting, in the searching, in the healing, in the hurting, like a blessing buried in the broken pieces. Every minute, every moment of where I've been and where I'm going, even when I didn't know it or couldn't see it, there was Jesus. For oh, this man who needs amazing kinds of grace, for forgiveness at a price I couldn't pay, I'm not perfect, so I thank God every day that there was Jesus. In the waiting, in the searching, in the healing, in the hurting, like a blessing buried in the broken pieces. Every minute, every moment of where I've been and where I'm going, even when I didn't know it or couldn't see it, there was Jesus on the mountains, in the valleys, in the shadows of the alleys, in the fire, in the flood. Always is and always was. No, I'll never walk alone. You are always there. In the waiting, in the searching, in the healing, in the hurting, like a blessing buried in the broken pieces. Every minute, every moment of where I've been and where I'm going, even when I didn't know it or couldn't see it, there was Jesus. There was Jesus. There Have you seen God this week? Hmm. Anybody got one? Where have you seen God this week? I know you had one. Where have you seen God this week, Frank? I'm absolutely sure you've seen him this week. <laughs> I've seen him in the lyrics you chose for oh. the last song. Yes, yes. That's a beautiful song. That is a beautiful one. I, I, uh, we, we, we practice this, and, and, uh, and I have trouble getting through that song without, without, it speaks right into my life. 
And, and, if, and if you listen to the words and the lyrics with that song, it speaks into a lot of lives. It really, really does. And, and it's, just a, it's just a beautiful and very touching song for me. I, I love it. And thank you, Frank. I appreciate it. I'm glad you like it, too. Has anybody else got one? Yes, I've seen God everywhere, every day, every morning when I get up. Constance and I sit, we're doing devotions, we look out the windows, and we see the wonders of our world, the wonders of our Lord. In particular, uh, we got a call from my niece, my brother's caregiver down in Mississippi. He's having some good days. He's been released from the hospital. His condition is still kind of um, questionable but he's had some good days the last three or four days. So we praise God, thank God for that, and see God everywhere. On the heels of art, if I could, um, Michael and I saw God this morning. Um, while we were getting ready for music practice, um, we, were, we do this every morning but today is a special we call it a, a two for Saturday because we're gonna run through them twice and while we were getting ready and sitting there there was this thump on the back uh, storm door and we have storm doors front and back and so sometimes the birds think that there's a pass-through and we'll get a thump on the back door and we've had everything from hummingbirds to blue jays hit that back door and this morning a very small bird hit the back door and when they and we've had cats <laughs> but all the cats were in luckily at that point, and this poor, small, gray and white bird had thumped on the back door, and um, they don't always successfully go back into the wild, if you know what I mean. Um, and this time, however, this little bird was, um, he was disoriented, and his eye was, you know, I could feel for him, and you know, his eye was kind of scrunched up, and he had some feathers ruffled, and left him on the back door, and I went up, and I picked him off the back porch, and I just had him cupped in my hands, and I can't remember the last time is that I picked up a bird so small, and just, you know, wh every time, every time it happens, and it's only happened a few, when it happens, you're mesmerized, because you see God's work in your hands, and you feel so helpless, they're so fragile, look what they do, they fly, they soar, they eat, they don't spin, they don't toil, and they don't worry, God sees everyone, and I thought of that scripture, I thought of Art and Constance, too, I told Michael, I said, you know, I th I th they always have this great story about when they're doing morning devotions and how they saw God. Well, here we are doing morning worship, and we're seeing God in this little bird that took a good 20 minutes to regain its composure and its strength and get its head together and then took flight again. So we saw God in a very small bird who fell to the earth and went back. Along those same lines regarding the, regarding the uh, devotions, we read the upper room every day, <coughs> and um, we're reading the Lenten scripture every day, which is it's kind of going along together, it should be. But we've been reading devotions from Charles Spurgeon, and um, it amazes us how that scripture, those devotions from that book, that little book, are always in, in concert with the day's devotions. And <clears throat> they have nothing to do with the upper room. It, it's a separate and apart little devotional book. And, but it, it just, it picks up the same thing, oftentimes references the same scripture. It's just amazing. <laughs> And, and you see God in that, you know that it's the, it's the word because it's just all, it, it's coming from everywhere. It's a beautiful thing. Yes, it is. It is a beautiful thing for sure. It, it, it's funny, it's funny I, uh, Constance mentions that. It, it, it's funny, uh, the lectionary calendar does the same thing. It, it speaks right into our life and it rolls right into, and it's so, so many times that that I, I realize that it that it speaks right to exactly what is happening to me this week. 
And so, and so I'm like, wow, okay. And so, and so it, it is amazing how God is at work. And if we realize and recognize him being at work in our life and in the world around us, it's, it's so much easier and it's so much more beautiful thing when, when we see him at work. Go ahead, Lizanne. Yeah. Um, I was uh, noticed how at the food bank last week, how there was this lady that uh, was... Uh, uh, she had ha been having some health issues and she hadn't been heard by her doctor. So I had an opportunity, because it was kind of quiet and there wasn't much going on, to uh, sit down and visit with her and listen to her. And um, then the conversation came around that, you know, that, uh, that she trusted God to help her through these struggles and then I and I asked her if she wanted me to pray with her and she did and um, I just know that you know um, I can't do these things on my own God's the one that gives me the strength to do it you know and helps me to see the opportunities and uh, take advantage of them and then today I, at, before we came in before i came in i was listening to a tape about handel's messiah and that's you know that's just a really neat piece of music about the glory of the lord <laughs> so. has anybody else got one Joy, concern, prayer request. Go ahead, Rose. I hadn't been to my doctor for six months, and I got to go this week. And he 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 checked my medicine. He he cut cut back on the medicine. Now I don't know what he said. It's my head. I don't know if I'm getting smarter or what, but he cut, cut the medicine down, and uh, he wants to see me in three weeks to see how I'm doing, but I don't know for sure what the medicine was really for, but he's he don't want me to take the dose I've been taking for a long time. So that... I guess that's going to help me, I hope, and with God's help, uh, things will start do, doing better. Uh, my neighbor's husband's father, the one I told you to pray for, well, he, he woke up but he can't see, and he can't eat, and he can't walk, but he's uh, off of the uh, vending machine. They're going to try to put him in the nursing home along with his wife. So uh, just pray that they can get that all kind of settled because they're both in kind of bad shape. And... Uh, Mildred said it would be good if God go ahead and take him home, but, you know, we don't have the, we can play one way or the other, but we don't really have the, it's up to God. Up to <laughs> but if, if he say, uh, that thing, they're going to have to be in the nursing home. And uh, so... At least I'm not in the nursing home yet. Uh, Joe told me that if I fell, fell and broke my hip, I, I wouldn't be at Rose Paul. But when I don't have a worker, you have to kind of live the best you can. And sometimes it's you think you can't do it by yourself. But with God's help and with fam family, I mean, people around, uh, you, you, you can get it done. 
I, I like the church. I, I missed last week because my kids surprised coming up, but uh, they know that they said, well, it's a, uh, uh, they only can come when they, when they surprised me that they, she, they'd come for a little while. Let's pray for uh, Mildred's uh, son-in-law and uh, aunt, and uh, that ev everything will work out for for them because they don't they 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 need to know kind of where where to take them and everything. Okay. Okay. Uh, got a got another another prayer request Anna Shannon uh, one of our one of our patrons at the Humansville Church her, her son Stan is uh, is in the hospital N doesn't uh, we, we we are praying for him uh, he's he's had uh, yeah he's had cancer they gave him chemo now he's got the f uh, flu and so and so this this chemotherapy really breaks down your immune system so you catch about everything that rolls ro along so it's a little worse than the flu. Uh, the sad part is, is that he had uh, cancer, stage four lung cancer, and uh, they believed it had moved into his lymph nodes as well. And this was probably some four months ago. He's been going through chemo and radiation. He just finished his last treatment, and he now has fungal pneumonia, which is potentially fatal in a larger percent of people who are in his position in particular and so Anna Shannon um, Tom and Stan Shannon need our prayers has anybody else got prayer requests a joy a concern how about uh, Brenda three pounds and I hope he can keep it on he struggles so much with all the allergies that affect his stomach and now he is swallowing and he wasn't able to swallow for about three months so it's just a day at a time with this little sweetie and i just praise god amen 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 that's good has anybody else got anything prayer requests a joy a concern uh martha is supposed to be watching on our facebook page so uh everybody say hello to martha martha and we're Martha, the whole crowd says hello, Martha, and thank you for joining in with us. We, we, we miss you. We miss you very much. Has anybody else got anything? Joy, concern, prayer request? If not, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll follow this by the Lord's Prayer. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, mighty God, we come before you once again today. Lord, we just thank you. We thank you for all of the places that we see you at work in our life, dear Lord, and the world around us. We ask, dear Heavenly Father, that you would be with each one of these prayer requests, each joy and each concern that we have, dear Lord. Today, you know our hearts and you know our minds. We ask you, dear Father, that you would be with us as we come together to pray the prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we come into this time of tithes and offerings, I would like to thank each one of you for your gifts, your tithes, and your offerings, and your support of the United Methodist Church here in Bolivar, Missouri, and the support of the Connection, and the support of the United Methodist Church worldwide. We appreciate everything that you do as far as, as, far as dollar-wise, monetary. It takes us a little bit of money to keep the churches running and all the facilities up and repaired, and, uh, and it takes a lot of work in the community to work in the community around you. So and our Bolivar Church really does a great job in working in their community and supporting their church. And so thank you all so very much. If you would join with me in the prayer of abundance. O oh, gracious, merciful, and abundant God, with thankful hearts we give you our praise, our offerings, and all that we are. Let the world see your generous nature working through us. Make us a reflection of your love. Amen.
spiritual blindness. Well, I know this goes against everything that we've been doing because we've been drawing line of sight to Jesus for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. And so you start talking about blindness, you don't see anything, right? Because you're blind. Has anybody ever been blind? I've been there. I've been blind. Our scripture today comes to you from Matthew's gospel, from John's gospel. And it's, a, and it's also another long read, so bear with me as we read through this. <clears throat> as he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God, of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground and made some mud with saliva and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he, said, he told him. Wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes opened, they asked. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash, so I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. They brought him to the Pharisees, the man who had been blind. Now, the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others ask, How can a sinner perform such a sign? So they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes that he opened. The man replied, he is a prophet. They still did not believe that he had been blind. And, they had, and he had received his sight until they sent for his, the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked. Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that he now can see? We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind, but how he can see now, or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who had already decided 
that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Then that was why his parents said, he's of age, ask him. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I have told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they hurled insults at him and said, You are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses. But as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, Now, that's remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes? We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, You were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe him too, in him too. Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking to you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, What, are we blind too? Jesus said, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. Now, that's a pretty long read. And there's a whole bunch of stuff in the midst of that. Spiritual blindness. And so where we've been going for the last several weeks in a row, we've been going through the throes of pointing Jesus out and where the disciples point Jesus out, where we see God and how we see God through these scriptures. And so we're talking about a blind man, so the blind man can't see, right? So when we look at this, we have been in John's gospel quite often, and it keeps jumping back to John's gospel. And John, and John tells some pretty long stories. Last, last week we had another long story about the woman at the well. And so when we look at this piece of scripture, I would like to address a couple of things in there, the progression. The progression of the blind man. When the first time that he says who healed him, he says, a man they called Jesus. So the introduction was the man that they called Jesus, okay? The blind man never asked to be healed. And we all come to Jesus in a different way. And we've already discussed that a couple of times. And we all come to Jesus in a different way. The blind man never even asked to be healed. The disciples ask, well, who is 
the one that sinned here? Was it the blind man himself that sinned, or was it his parents' sin? Well, commonly in this culture, in this time period, it was, it was a common thing to, to if, if somebody was born with a birth defect, or if they were suffering, if they, if they came down with cancer, or, or any other of a number of diseases, uh, they always said, okay, well, what have you done? What have you sinned? So they were very narrow. They were very narrow focused, and they were very narrow in their theology of God's, of what God done to done to discipline them and so when when you look at this you go okay well so they're very narrow-minded and so their focus is very sharp and pointed and so the disciples if the disciples believe this same thing the Pharisees also believed this same thing so they was looking at the blind man as a sinner or somebody that had sinned or his parents sinned before him, or somebody down the generations had sinned before him, which caused him to be blind. And so when you look at this, you go, okay. So the blind man had not asked to be healed, but Jesus leaned over, spit in a piece of mud, in some mud, in some dust on the ground, kneaded it together, and put it on his eyes. When I researched this for thousands of years, they have said that mud, that is an old remedy. If you put a mud pack on your eyes for swelling, it will make the swelling go down in your eyes. Did you know that? I didn't, not until this week. So all of a sudden, all of a sudden, this old remedy becomes a healing that Jesus done. And so, well, I want to look at the progression. So there was four different times that he was asked, or three different times that he was asked, and one time they asked his parents. So the man's progression here was in the first time that they asked him, he said, a man that they called Jesus. The second time the Pharisees asked him, he said, he was a prophet. P progression progression so he went from a man they called Jesus to must have been a prophet because otherwise my eyes wouldn't been healed because only a prophet can do this sort of thing could perform this sort of miracle then after Jesus found him when they threw him out of the temple all of a sudden he says then the man said Lord I believe and he worshipped him. The progression. The Methodists call this provenient grace. It's what we call this. The grace of God that is around us even when we don't know or can't see it. That provenient grace that draws us to God. Without anything, God is all around us and he pours out his grace upon us. It's free. It's free. It doesn't cost us anything. God gives us this grace. Whether we ask or whether we don't. Now, if you think about all of the miracles that Jesus performed, there was one that touched him, and there was one that, that he healed from a far distance. There was, there was one that, that asked to heal my servant that is laying home in bed, right? There were several different things that Jesus done in different ways that the healing came about and I think it's significant for us to realize that because everyone because we talk about this and everyone comes to Jesus a different way everyone's healed in a different way also each person has their own individual personality and God knows that because he made each one of you he does and he made each one of you individual as you are and each one of you is perfect just the way you are because God made you. He did not do anything imperfect. Everything that God did was perfect. And so each and every one of you was made perfect in God's eyes. Now, does that make you feel good about things or not? That's got to make you have a good feeling, right? Because God made you. And he made you perfect. And he made you an individual. And he made you not like anyone else. 
We all are individuals, and God loves each and every one of us. And he pours out his grace and opens his arms to all, all people, everyone. I like to look at the progression because that is where we see God in the scripture. Same thing with the woman at the well. It was a progression. It doesn't happen immediately. It happens as we come to God, as we let ourselves be involved with God. And so when we start looking at this, I've got a couple more things that I'd like to kind of look at. The, the reactions of, of these folks. So, I'm getting so many notes. The reaction, the neighbors, they were surprised and skeptic about this man being healed. And so we all are a little bit that way with God and, and, and his working, right? We're all a little bit that way. Sometimes you see something and you go, ah, somebody says, oh, well, that's got to work, and he's just wonderful. And, wonderful. and you go, well, I don't know. Skeptic. We're skeptic. Some of us jump right in in the middle of that and say, yep, that is got to work. And some of us go, well, you know what? Here again, we're all individuals. We're all individuals. Some people see things differently than others. And surprised. Sometimes we, God's actions in the world around us, it surprises us that God can still do what he can do without anything from us. And how wonderful that is. The Pharisees were prejudgmental and disbelieving. And, and I'd like to hang on that one for just a second. The Pharisees are pretty judgmental. And they didn't believe hardly any of them at all. And this is, I feel like that this is why that this happens this way. The Pharisees were the keepers of the law. And they were always investigating just like in this piece of scripture right there, they were, they were brought in to investigate this. And so while they were investigating, they immediately started to picking on this Sabbath day thing, that they had put a whole lot of extra stuff around the Sabbath day. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy is what the Ten Commandments say. Well, when the Pharisees got a hold of it, and, 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 I, and I like to equate this to our laws uh, and our congressmen and senators, we, we, have, we have all of these people that make all of these laws, and when they, when they get finished making the law, they go, okay, well, we haven't got nothing to do, so let's make another law. So it makes another law, makes another law, makes another law. So you pile one law on top of another law on top of another law, and you never do get finished. And so the problem of that is, is the more laws you have, the more criminals it makes. And so they criminalized Jesus within the midst of their law. And it, was, and it was not right because Jesus was following the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been at the place that he was at the day he was there. Same thing with the Samaritan woman. He was walking along, gets to the well, sits down at the well. The disciples go into town at noon, which nobody was supposed to be drawing water at that time, and the Samaritan woman comes along. God put him in that spot at that time for a reason. God put him in this spot at this time for a different reason. So we come into this, and so we've got the Pharisees, and they're, they're prejudging, and they're disbelieving. We've got the parents who believed but they wanted to believe very quietly, like Nicodemus. Remember that story? When we, when we come through Nicodemus, he came to Jesus at night. Didn't want nobody to see him. Nicodemus got a little bolder and stood up at, at Jesus' trial 
And then the last time we see Nicodemus in the Bible, we see him with Joseph of Arimathea taking Jesus off the cross of Calvary and anointing his body was the last time we hear of Nicodemus. But he was a believer, but a quiet believer. And that reminds me of some folks around me. I've got a lot of believers around me, and some of them are very quiet about their belief. They believe, but they don't want to cause no ways, or they don't want to make nobody mad, or they don't want to push their opinion on no one. And you know what? That's okay. But I want to tell you something about the way you come to God. The way you come to God is individual as you are. And your individual testimony is a piece of what God gives you of his grace. Do you notice how this man tells the story? I don't know whether he was a sinner or not, but I do know this. I was blind and now I see. Very simple, just a few short words, but how powerful is it? How powerful is that testimony? The testimony of you coming to Christ is your individual testimony, and it has power. It has power. God gives you that to give you his power, his Holy Spirit, so you can throw that testimony out there to someone or tell them how you come to Jesus and it is powerful. It is powerful to you. It is powerful to them. And it also, every time you tell that story, it strengthens you and moves you forward as an individual. And the next time you go to tell that story, that story is much easier to tell. And it's more powerful each time also. God gives you this testimony, and this is a testimony is what it is. When, when he gives this, this piece of scripture to us, he gives it to us as a testimony. This is a testimony from the blind man. And do you notice how he got more powerful each time? Each time he told it, he told it a little bit more forceful. He told it a little bit more. And all of a sudden, the blind man that has received his sight also had received a spiritual wisdom. Let me read this to you. The man answered. Now, that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to godly persons who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a blind of a man born blind if this man were not a, from God he could not do nothing to this they replied you were steeped in sin at birth how dare you lecture us and they threw him out see how defensive they got as soon as that powerful testimony come out all of a sudden these Pharisees got defensive on him and they threw him out of the synagogue excommunicated him now the culture that we're looking at that was what it was that was all they did that was they went to the temple they worshiped they done their thing it was all based around this religious thing that they did and when you got excommunicated all of a sudden you were out in the middle of nowhere away from the whole society that was involved in the religious ceremonial worship that was going on. And so the parents, afraid of the Pharisees, they didn't want to get excommunicated, but the blind man himself didn't matter to him, now did it? He had received something beautiful and awesome. when we look into this also we see this spiritual blindness be careful and when I when I said I've been blind before 
I have. Be careful when you think you know too much about this book. Be careful. Be careful. Because when you think you know everything about this book, you're mistaken. Because we don't know even half of what this book tells us. And the Pharisees had the book. They were the keepers of the law. So they felt like that they knew everything that they needed to know about the law. And it turns out they didn't know half of what they thought they knew. And when I look at this, I go, boy, you know what? And we're looking at people 2,000 years ago. It doesn't apply to us, does it? Yes, it does. Because I've been in the position where I thought, you know what? Before I started into ministry school and course of study, I was raised in church from the time I was a little kid. I was taught the stories of the Bible over and over and over again from the time I was a little kid. And I know there's others in here that's been the same way. And when you, when you sit there and you go, okay, you know what? I know everything about the Bible. I, d I don't need to learn anymore. I don't need to gain any more wisdom and knowledge. I already have it all. And then all of a sudden, something comes up where you go, oh, I didn't know that. I never looked at that that way. And somebody helps you along to see something that God is revealing to you out of this book. I, I, have, this, I have this tendency to think, you know, every time I pick up this book now, I get something different out of it. I do. And I don't know why that is. The living word, the living word of God is just tremendous. It, there is so much knowledge and wisdom there that we can never fathom it all. The Pharisees had gotten stuck. They thought they knew everything that there was to know. They had every law down. They knew it all. And there was nothing that they didn't know. And so when Jesus broke the law of the Sabbath by working, making the mud was the working part of it. Making the mud, he was not doing the Sabbath because you don't supposed to work on the Sabbath. But he did. And he healed the blind man. And all of a sudden, Jesus they were trying to push him out, trying to figure out a way to crucify him. And the Pharisees were afraid. They were afraid of losing their power. They were afraid of losing their position. God wants from us a steady progression. And we see this with the Nicodemus story. We see this with the with the Samaritan woman's story. And we see this once again with this blind man's story. God wants a steady progression from us. There's no point in your life that you can get to the point where you can say, I know everything that there is to know in this book. There's no place. There's no spot. And there's no spot that you can say, oh, well, I know everything and just ask me, I'll tell you. There just ain't no spot there. There's just not. We're all students. We're all students, each and every one of us. And it doesn't matter how old we are or young we are. We're all students of Christ. If we've accepted Christ into our heart, we're all students and we're all learning. I've got a, a friend from years ago. And here's how this applies to us. Had a friend years ago, and he decided that he was going to find a church home. And he went to church, and I talked to him after he had went to this first church that he went to, and he said, well, you know, I know a lot about the Bible. I was raised in church. 
And I just don't believe just exactly what that preacher said here. And I don't believe like this over here. And I'm not going back there. Spiritual blindness. He went to the next church, and he done the same thing. Well, I know a lot about the Bible, and I don't believe that, that that pastor said, and I don't believe that way. I didn't say anything to him. I said, well, you know, did you have a good service? Well, no, 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 no I'm not going to go back there. The next church, and the next church, and the next church, and the next church. He was at seven different churches in one year, and none of them fit him. I was, <laughs> I got a hold of this piece of scripture <laughs> last week, and I, was, I read through it. I always pick up my scripture on Sunday night, you know, read through it, sit down, think about it, you know, and I think spiritual blindness, spiritual blindness, spiritual blindness. What does that mean to us? What does that mean to us? I come in the house Monday morning after I was out peddling around outside bright and early, almost dark still. Joyce Myers is on television. Man, I don't like her. I really don't. She always tags me on something. I don't know why it is. And I listen to her. I come in and I go, man, really? And she said this. If you come to a service with a rebellious attitude, this hinders you from receiving a blessing that God has in store for you in that service. And I was like, wow. That's spiritual blindness, sure enough. So if you come into a service looking for something to disagree about, it keeps you from getting a blessing that God has for you in that service. And so we all tend to be a little spiritual blind because I've done this myself. I've done that very same thing myself. And I thought of my friend when I heard Joyce Meyer say that. And then I turned around and I thought of myself. When I went into the bathroom and looked in the mirror, I was like, oh, you've done that too. You've done that too. I've sat in services before and said, you know what, I don't agree with what they're saying. And right there, everything stops. You cannot receive a blessing when you're disagreeing with everything that's going on there. And it's the truth. It's the truth. And I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen in services. I've seen it happen in classes. I've been there too. I've been there too. When I shut down in a class, when I'm sitting in a classroom with a teacher up there and I go, oh, I don't believe that. All of a sudden, everything goes away and I can't hear a word. As long as I come in with an open heart and an open mind, I get blessed so part of this is about us and how we enter into a service and how we try to receive God's word if we are if we sit there and we've got an attitude of rebellion against whoever whatever teacher preacher whatever that happens to be, if we've got this attitude of rebellion when we come into it, it's hard for us to receive a blessing or it's hard, to, hard for us to learn anything. It is. This is spiritual blindness, folks, in its simplest form. It really is. And, and we've all, we all are guilty of it. The Pharisees were leaders. They were leaders. And they were guilty of it. How do you figure that we get by without it? We don't. We don't. We have parts of it too. And spiritual blindness gets us all. And so when God puts that Holy Spirit inside of us, he helps us to be open. Now I'm not saying 
brothers and sisters, I'm not saying follow whatever leader and whatever thing. You have to be discerning also. And you have to know what this scripture says. And I think that is key. I really do. We have to be open. What I like about the United Methodist Church, it allows you to be open. It allows you to be open. It allows you to read this scripture. It allows you to take whatever out of that scripture. It allows you to speak about that scripture. And it allows you to learn and grow together. It does. It does. And the Methodist Church has been wonderful to me. It really is. I like to look at the sanctification of grace. We talked about provenient grace just a little bit, the grace that draws us into a relationship with God. The sanctifying grace, I always like to illustrate it like the layers of an onion, peeling off a layer, peeling off another layer, peeling off another layer as God reveals our sin to us. The spiritual blindness is the same way. The spiritual blindness is something that you may not even realize that you're doing. But all of a sudden, God peels off a layer and lets you see it. And then all of a sudden, now you see where you've been going wrong with some of this stuff. And I'm there. I'm there. I took this piece of scripture this week and I went, wow, you know, I'm a toad. I'm a toad. And I've thought that many times about myself. I really have because within this book and within the five, six, seven, how many years have I been doing? I've been doing this quite a while now. And every year it reveals more stuff to me that I'm not doing just exactly right. And I've got to adjust myself. But the thing about it is, is we got to look at this and realize, look at it and then look in the mirror and say, okay, is that me? And when we see ourselves in these lessons, then it's our obligation to go, okay, well, you know what? God also gives us self-control. He also gives us self-control. And we have the ability through the Holy Spirit to control self. And buddy, I tell you what, that's a guy that's tough. I have hard time controlling self. I really do. But God gives me the ability to control self and with his grace and his love and his caring, I'm gaining the upper hand on self. It's taken me a while, but I'm gaining, I'm gaining. We're all moving towards perfection. In the United Methodist Church, sanctification of grace is just that. We move towards perfection. We're never going to get there until we get to the other side. But we realize every time we take a step forward, this is a journey. Just like it's always been said, this is a journey. Once we take a step forward, then we work on something else. Then we take another step forward and we work on something else. Because we gain and we become a better person each time we take another step. All of us are in a different spot on our journey. Each and every one of us are. Some of us are back here. Some of us are up here. Some of us are with baby steps. And some of us take big steps. I've taken a lot of baby steps over my life. A bunch of them. I'm taking some little bit bigger steps now. But you know what? It's about time to get off the milk and get onto the meat. We can't survive on baby food all of our lives. We have to move forward. And this piece of scripture that we looked at this week makes me realize that the progression of this blind man do you realize what Jesus done for him? How his life changed in that moment? And what made him so bold to talk to the Pharisees like that? Buddy, I'm going to tell you this. This blind man knew nothing else but begging at the front door of the temple. He knew nothing else in his life but that. 
to be bold enough to talk up to the Pharisees to where you might be excommunicated and thrown out of the temple. He didn't know nothing else. He didn't know nothing else. This was his whole life. Everything. We look at this piece of scripture and we, go, we think, okay, well, you know what? What is, what is this? God could have healed this man just by saying you're healed. Pick up your mat and go on. I seen him do that one, one other time. But when we think about the clay, you think about God, the potter, the potter. You think about this pool of Siloam, which Siloam means sent. Jesus was sent to us. This pool of Siloam, there's a little bit of history around that too. That was uh, King Hezekiah that made this pool. He uh, tunneled through 2,000 feet of solid rock. Well, not him, his men or his people that were doing this to s tap into a spring so Jerusalem would have water inside the city just in case they come under siege. This pool of Siloam was the very bottom pool and it was used for ritual cleansing. It was in the southeast corner of the inside of the wall of the city. And so when you came into the, to the temple, you bathed in the pool of Siloam and then you went into the temple. Ritual cleansing. That's what it was all about water of life so the symbolism around this is also there and so when we look at this piece of scripture you go okay well there's there's several things there you know there is a lot of things there there really is so we talked about the reactions of the neighbors the Pharisees the parents, the reaction of the man was this. He showed consistency in his faith growth. Every time you heard from this man, he stepped forward again. He stepped forward again. He got bolder in his faith. Each and every time, the consistent boldness of his faith Jesus wants steady progression not instant perfection a lot of people say oh well I've been saved now I'm fine I'm instantly perfect no you're not no you're not what God wants from us is steady progression not instant perfection we looked at all of these different eyewitnesses we seen Peter and his eyewitness of Jesus being transfigured and, and all of these different eyewitnesses. This blind man, he was an eyewitness also, an eyewitness of Christ. We can all be blind, but we can still hear Jesus' voice. God bless you all. Would you stand? Seems like all I could see was the struggles Haunted by ghosts that lived in my past Bound up in shackles of all my failures Wondering how long is this gonna last Then you looked at this prisoner and say to me, son Stop fighting a fight that's already been won. I am redeemed. You set me free. So I'll shake off these.
Chevy chains Wipe away every stain But I'm not who I used to be I am redeemed I'm redeemed All my life I have been called unworthy Named by the voice of my shame and regret But when I hear you whisper, child, lift up your head, I remember, oh God, you're not done with me yet. I am redeemed. You set me free. So I'll shake off these heavy chains and wipe away every stain. Now I'm not who I used to be, because I don't have to be the old man inside of me, because his day is long dead and gone, because I got a new name, a new life, and I'm not the same, and a hope that'll carry me home. I am set me free so i'll shake off these heavy chains and wipe away every stain now i'm not who i used to be i am redeemed thank god redeemed Heavenly Father, we come before you once again today, Lord. We just thank you. We thank you for your redeeming grace that you have poured out on us, dear Lord, unworthy servants. We ask, dear Father, that you would forgive us where we fail you, and we fail you in so many ways. We ask, dear Father, that you would go with us now as we go out into the world, dear Lord, and reflect your light into a world of darkness. In Jesus' precious and holy name we pray, amen. As you take the light of Christ out into the world this week, remember, someone is always watching you. God bless you all. Thank you for being here.